you don't need to see me anyway. As a matter of fact, Susanna Harris is up next and she's going to talk with us about tackling violence as a barrier to education. All right, Susanna, are you there? I am there. I'm um, just so let me do that. Um, and while she's getting ready, uh, we've heard already that um, violence is something that girls face disproportionately, particularly sexual violence, and that sometimes parents pull their students out of school because of those fears. So she's going to give us an idea about what we can do about it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope you can all see my slides now. Yes. Um, so I want to pick up on this theme that's come through in both of the um, the first presentations from Pauline and Anthara, um, and to go into a bit more detail on the issue of violence in schools. Um, I think far too often when we hear about when we far too often schools and school systems really fail at the core tasks of keeping children safe from harm in school. I don't think any of us here would let our children um, go to school that subjected them to abuse. Um, but it seems to me that sort of international organisations have been quite slow to get behind addressing this, this issue that's really core to education. Um, for example, if you read the World Bank's 2018 World Development Report, a great report, and one of my dear colleagues was um, sort of core to the writing of it, you barely see a mention of violence against kids in that report. Um, and I want to sort of make the case today that violence in schools um, against girls and also against boys deserves the same technocratic seriousness um, as that that's dedicated to improving enrollment and improving test scores. Um, so I'm going to go through first of all a bit of the data on what we know about school violence and um, then I'll talk about why I think it's not yet a priority for the global education sector and then try to um, I guess be a bit more action orientated than, um, than usual in these presentations on school violence. There are things that we can do and I think we should be doing more, more of it. Um, so first of all school violence is pervasive. Um, this is um, two sets of data, uh, DHS and PISA data. Uh, PISA for development is a set of education assessments focused on developing countries. Um, and as part of the survey it asks 15 year olds um, if they've experienced unwanted or inappropriate touching by their teachers. Um, the country coverage is quite limited at the moment, um, but the results from the two African countries that participated are pretty startling for, for both boys and girls, actually. Um, one in eight boys and girls in Senegal and in Zambia report having been sexually harassed by a teacher in the last four weeks, not ever, but the last four weeks. Um, I guess I wanted to, just at this point to pick up on, on Pauline's really good points about the differential impact of violence against girls and boys. And, you know, it certainly isn't either or. Um, I think we can see from some of this data that both are exposed. Um, I'm going to talk a bit later about why the data is not good enough. And one reason for that is that, you know, violence against boys and girls is probably quite different. Different perpetrators, different locations, different types of violence. And if we're going to understand how to tackle it, we really have to understand that differential experience, exposure and impact on, on boys and girls. Um, so let's move on. And um, the chart on the left hand side, this is um, DHS data, demographic and, demographic and health survey data, um, which is quite an important source of teacher perpetrated sexual violence. Um, in these surveys, adult women are asked, has anyone ever forced you in any way to have sexual intercourse? Um, when you did not want to, and they also asked who the perpetrator was the first time the woman was forced. And the most common perpetrators are a current um, or former husband or partner, but for a small percentage of women, it was a teacher. Um, and even though it's a small percentage, that translates into millions of women, um, over 10 million women in India, 6 million in the DRC, and 3 million in Nigeria, who've all experienced rape by a teacher. Just simply unacceptable. Um, a different type of violence in schools, corporal punishment, um, it's still lawful in um, more than 60 countries that in, in those countries live um, half of the world's school aged children. Um, and it continues in countries even where it's legally banned, um, often unfortunately with the support of parents. 
Um, a study of eight-year-olds in four countries found that the majority of those children had witnessed a teacher using corporal punishment in the last week. It's not just a developing country issue, um, teacher corporal punishment in the United States, um, it's in decline, but it's still legal. Um, and in three states, it's used in more than um, half of schools. Um, so it's always pretty shocking to me to learn that the US hasn't um, completely banned that yet. Um, emotional violence from teachers, verbal abuse and humiliation um, is also pretty common in schools. Um, and at times children can find that more upsetting than physical punishment. Um, so violent discipline continues to be an everyday reality for many children around the world, and it's a clear violation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, so then why I'm saying it's not yet a priority in the global education sector. Um, I think, you know, I can argue that as the global education world is sort of doubling down on um, good and um, needed efforts to address the global learning crisis. It's not clear that there are sufficient efforts going into keeping um, girls safe at school. Um, there are lots of good people working on ways to eliminate violence against girls in school, including um, people um, at this meeting today. Um, and often the data, this data isn't going to surprise them. But I think many people, including those who work every day in the global education sector, just don't realise the scope of the problem. Um, and I think that's why we're trying to keep sounding the alarms. Um, some of these publications up on the screen now, um, World Bank, GPE publications, really sort of no, um, no focus on school violence at all. Um, it's surprising to me that there's no target in the SDG specifically focused on eliminating violence in school. And of course, there are many competing priorities in education and policymakers globally and domestically are regularly forced to make trade-offs. Um, but I think everything else is pretty much secondary to making sure that children are safe from harm while they're at school. Um, however, since we're trying to also sort of provide good news um, at this meeting too, um, some donors do take school violence seriously. So education policies from the UK FCDO, um, USAID, um, both published sort of more recently, do, um, do sort of have a strong focus on, on violence in schools, but others like these ones on the screen um, barely touch on the topic. Um, I think another reason it doesn't get much attention is it's it's kind of seen as OK by a lot of core stakeholders in the education system. So this is data from a CGD survey of education policymakers and MPs, and we surveyed about 600 um, and asked them sort of their views and perceptions on various education related topics, including corporal punishments. Um, it's a huge heterogeneity across different countries, um, but you can see in quite a few countries um, among policymakers, um, there's strong support for the ability of um, teachers to be children. So the question was two MPs and two policymakers and education ministries. Do you think that teachers and parents are ever justified in beating children? Um, and quite a lot think that it is sometimes or always justified. Um, and then many of you may know about the Transforming Education Summit that took place um, late September, a couple of months ago in New York. Um, as part of that summit, um, about 100 countries submitted statements of commitments ahead of the meeting, which have outlined their priorities and commitments for their education systems. Um, and again, we saw that school safety sort of ranked quite low in terms of priorities compared with other education issues. Um, I think teaching and learning rightly at the top there, teachers rightly at the top, but it's not clear to me that sort of technology and so on is a, an issue of more importance than keeping children safe in schools. Um, so what more can we do to eliminate violence in schools? Um, I think three things that we at CGD and many of our partners um, really want to do is to get better data on school violence, to generate better evidence on what works to eliminate violence, and to get the education sector to care more. Um, so on sort of the data challenge specifically, one of the one sort of real problem is a difficulty in obtaining reliable and up to date data about the scale and nature of the school violence crisis. Um, so what I mean here is that um, terms like sexual harassment and sexual abuse um, are used quite interchangeably um, and not always consistently. And definitions of, um, of abuse can range from bullying and verbal abuse all the way through to teacher perpetrated rape of students. Um, let's be clear, all are bad, but they're different and often different perpetrators, different victims, different locations. 
It's not clear from the data where children are most at risk. Um, school related violence can cover children in school, around school or on their way to school. And clearly some of the gender issues around where girls are most, most at risk really come through there. Um, and so I think we need to know much more about the problem. Um, and then secondly, we need to generate better evidence on what actually works to eliminate violence in schools. So we, we simply don't have enough well evidenced interventions. Um, not to say that there are none. Um, there are some superb organisations working day in, day out um, to try to tackle this problem. Um, Raising Voices, Breakthrough India and many others. And I think it's important now that we identify more promising interventions and generate that evidence through rigorous evaluations and provide policymakers um, and donors with options if they want to invest in reducing violence. Um, and then we need to get the education sector to care a bit more. Um, I think it's, it should be the case that no school system can be deemed good if its schools aren't safe. No school should be deemed good if it's not safe for children. And um, I'm delighted that we're talking about it here at this education conference. Um, I don't think it should be possible to go to an education conference where preventing violence against children is not sort of core to that conference agenda. Um, so a lot to do and a huge amount to do to try to differentiate the, the impacts um, and the solutions for boys and girls. Um, but I think there's some momentum now um, to tackle this issue. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with um, all of you um, to try to advance this agenda. Susanna, thank you so much. Um, there's one question I would really like to ask. When you say get better data on school violence, again, half the world's children are subject to corporal punishment. How do we get really accurate data that does not support those practices, but that's really neutral? If you're at a country or in a state where that's acceptable, how do we normalize at least making it fair until we can grow out of it? I'll just go with that. Yeah, you ask um, really good and really difficult questions. Um, I. That that's one of the core challenges, you know, even in the UK where I am, where corporal punishment has been banned for about 20 years now, um, about 50 percent of parents still think it should be brought back. Um, so, you know, we do see that support um, for corporal punishment drops off um, in the years following a ban. Um, but often parents think it's the right way to discipline um, children and to make schools orderly and, um, and academic. Um, and sort of collecting data in those contexts can be really challenging. So we have so many challenges around collecting data on school violence. It's difficult to ask children about their exposure to violence. We then can't do very much about it. Um, so if you ask a child to report that their teacher has beaten them or, or abused them or worse, and then you can't offer some support to that child um, when they're sort of suffering post-trauma. That's a very difficult thing to do ethically. Um, and then we also have issues about disclosure. So sometimes children, teachers will be nervous um, about disclosing violence that they've been exposed to because culturally um, it may be normal Normalize that women are exposed to violence or they may be scared about their job or retaliation from their teachers. Um, there was a fascinating paper released yesterday by a team at Raising Voices and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine who've been working together for, um, for about 10 years now on reducing violence in schools in Uganda. And some of the interviews that they shared in that paper that they had done with children and teachers about the reasons why they weren't able to um, disclose or report the violence was just, it was really enlightening. And it kind of showed someone like me who works mostly with quantitative data, why those sort of qualitative interviews and really kind of understanding um, the nuance of, of school violence experiences is, is so important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can simply say if you are an educator in those spaces, be aware that, again, students are not necessarily going to be able to report or even have the language to report uh, an abusive, uh, bu uh, an abuse of this power. So then be aware of asking the right kinds of questions. There's some great resources out there. Um, ask the right kinds of questions. And most of all, be that trusted adult in the space. That's the best thing that you can do that we all can do. All right, thank you again. I appreciate so much um, your quantitative data and for sharing just kind of how we can tackle those issues from, you know, across the world, across the globe. Thank you again.